Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here in this lunchtime Friday session. Uh, my name is Juanpe, and I'm a freelancer, uh, consultant, contractor based in Berlin, in Germany, uh, working a lot on interactive software. And today I'm going to talk about the most valuable values. Values here, not as in ethics or economic value. They could be very interesting topics as well. But of course, as in our favorite topic as C++ programmers, value semantics. And a lot of my work has been preoccupied with making value semantics scale. So last year here, I presented a data structure library uh, about immutable data structures that it's basically that's the point, making value semantics scale. But I feel like a lot of C++ developers don't really understand what that means. So I decided to make this talk a little bit more philosophical, conceptual about how to talk about value semantics and how to talk about value semantics in the context of software architecture. So we have to start defining what value semantics is, right? So value semantics is composed of these two words, value and semantics. Semantics means meaning. And so basically value semantics is about attributing meaning to our programs, understanding what they, what they are through values, through the values that are expressed in the code of our programs. And what are values? I'm going to start just by giving examples. And these examples are not, uh, don't think about code, right? Think just about values outside of code. You can talk about them uh, without being programming. So the, the number 42 is a value. That's an easy one, no, an integer. Uh, a color could be a value. A string, a name is a value. A function, a function is a value. It's a special kind of value, right? Because it's a relationship between other values. And in this representation, it also introduces names. We name va values, that's very important. We name here the relationship itself with the name F, and we name any value with the name X to be able to establish this relationship. The set of all natural numbers, is it a value? Of course it, it is a value. You may say, oh, but I cannot represent it in my memory. Well, you can definitely put it in a slide that is finite, so you can represent it in your computer maybe somehow. And anyways, computers are not the only things that do interesting things with values. So I find that, oh, and one thing that is very important here, though, is that what you're looking at in this screen, they are not the values themselves. You're looking at representations of values, right? These are characters printed in a screen, energy, atoms. The real values, they are the concepts in your mind, the ideas that you get when you see these things somehow, right? Which are probably other representations in neurons or whatever, but the experience you have when thinking about these things, that's, that's the real value. So I find it very useful uh, to talk about values, the metaphor that the philosopher Plato used when he talked about his notion of platonic ideas. That is represented here in this picture. He introduced this metaphor, which is uh, the myth of the cave. He argued that we are like the slaves here in the bottom right corner of the screen that are entrapped behind this wall. And we can see only reality through the shadows that are projected. Uh, oops, sorry. Can you use this one? Uh, that are projected uh, over the wall of the screen in the wall be, uh, before us. But the reality is different, right? These shadows is the real world that we see, the material things, the representations, the bits, the ones and zeros. But the, the reality itself is the ideas that are pure, that are more like values behind us. Um, here I put this particular value, Juan P. Bolivar, that's my name. I put it in quotes to emphasize the fact that I'm referring to the string. But if I remove the quotes, if I'm talking about myself, am I a value? Hmm. Well, let's follow the platonic metaphor and try to think if, if we associate values with platonic ideas, am I a platonic idea? Well, they are abstract. They are immaterial. They are necessary. So there is no prior condition necessary for ideas to exist. They, they are not composed of atoms. 
they are eternal, right? They're never born and never uh, die, an idea. It's just there floating in some vacuum. And they are immutable, right? You, you cannot really change an idea. You can derive other ideas and other definitions. But an idea itself, well, it exists in this space that is eternal and immutable. I myself, well, I think I am concrete and I am material. I exist. I'm here in this space. You're seeing me, I hope, on stage. I am contingent. Right? I, <laughs> there, there, there are many conditions um, uh, required for me to exist, including like generations and generations of people having sex at the right time in the right places. Um, I am temporary. I'm sure I will be dead at some point. And I am mutable, right? I am actually walking <laughs> along the stage all the time. I change my position, I change my mind, I change everything, right? So I don't think I'm really an idea. I am something else. I am a thing that exists in the real world. And before people accuse me of Platonists, I must say that I actually think that Plato was wrong. I'm not an idealist. I, re I believe, unlike Plato, that the things that exist in the real world are more real than the things that exist in this uh, ideal world. However, ideas and values, they are useful, and they are useful tools for thinking for two reasons. One, they are abstract, and this means that they are about forgetting, right? Ideas contain less details than the reality, the complex reality that they come from, so they are useful to think in this sense. They are forgetting, but they are also remembering. I can have ideas about a thing even when the thing is not exist or its representation is not present, right? I can close my eyes, I don't see you guys, but I can reason about you because even though, uh, so you exist, but I also have an idea about who you are in my mind that I can represent as a value and I can think about. So, <clears throat> if things are not values, how can we create this connection between the things that exist in the real world and the values? And this is, a, I think, one of the big challenges that we face afterwards as software developers. Um, and of course, one obvious way is to have one value that represents the whole existence of a thing, right? So we can imagine the movie of one person's life, like this one, right, encompassing all its, their states, and, and this is just a value, right? If you're thinking about programming, you may think, well, this is very expensive to store in memory. And there are also values that, for example, they, or there, there are things that are alive, right? So how can you talk about my life as a value when there are parts of my life that have, hasn't happened yet? But there are many ways, actually, in computers when, uh, that you can use to do this, right? Like you have functions over time. This is a value that represents the whole existence of a thing in a, in a deterministic synthesis, uh, system. You can have a stream of events that you can transform and reason about. And even though you don't know the events that come in the future, you can reason about it. There are many ways in which this representation is useful. But more often, we actually take a snapshot of this state, right? We take a picture of one thing that is happening, one single state of the thing, and we represent this in the computer. It's like taking a frame, a photograph in this movie of the thing's existence. But we have many of these that we have to connect somehow, because these states themselves, they are different from each other. How do we know that they belong to the same thing? And we do that by values of identity. These are a special kind of value that allow us to associate the multiple snapshots that we take from a thing to the thing itself that um, changes over time. Right? And in the real world, we use these things all the time, right? Like, I have an identity card for, from the Spanish state that has a number that allows the state to differentiate myself from any other Spanish citizen. And, you know, when different people go to different bureaucrat uh, bureaucratic entities with this card, they can know it's actually the same person, right? It's not different copies from different states from different things. Um, but some people use just my name, right? Because in this room, no one has uh, this name. So this is a sufficient uh, identity to differentiate me and at the same time to associate me to the thing, right? There, there are always this tension between these two uh, utilities in an identity. <clears throat> 
Uh, we can use an email address that's often used, for example, in web services, right? You register with an email, and that's uh, the thing that identifies you. And very often in computers, we use these things, universally IDs, uh, uh, GUIDs. Basically, you generate a big random number that you know you cannot collide, and you say this number is associated to this thing, and you use this. And this is very useful and powerful. So now we know about values, we know about things, we know how to associate the two things together, but one of the most important things we do with values is to communicate about them with other people and with computers. We are programmers. We are talking about C++. So of course, uh, the most important thing we can do here is to give them names, right? And with names we saw, we can establish relationships, we can reason about them. So we can say, let the value x be, or sorry, let the name x be associated to the number 42, y to the result of applying this relationship between x and another value. We can have collections that are values, we can have functions that are values, we can apply the functions to other functions through higher order functions to get other values, and we establish all these relationships by giving names. There are languages like this. This is Haskell. And it's a language that I would say it's very value semantic because the only thing you can name in this language is a value, actually. However, there are other languages. This could be Java. In this case, it's C++. And in C++, I gave names uh, to something, right? So I say int foo equals 42. But it's important to note that I, what, I'm, what I'm naming here is not a value. I'm not naming the value 42. What is happening in C++ is that I'm naming something else. I'm naming an object in memory. And an object is this region in memory, a block of squares, that by the rules of C++ is said to be associated to this name for this scope in particular. Uh, that's the name. And then in this box, we put the value, right? And this is important, right? Uh, because this object is a thing, actually, right? This object is a thing that exists over time. It has a lifetime, in this case, the scope. It has an identity, which is its pointer, that we can query with the uh, ampersand. And we can actually use this identity to do things to it, right? To modify it and to make it evolve over time. So an object, in this sense, is, as I said, a location plus a type that is important that restricts and gives meaning to the values that are stored inside the box, inside the object, plus a lifetime, which is when, it's uh, when it lives or when it's born and when it's dead. And this is very important. As I said, identities has a scope, which is the set of things that it allows us to distinguish the things between. The identity that we give to objects, the pointers, they're only valid to distinguish alive objects between other alive objects, right? This is why we have problems like dangling pointers when we try to use that identity to identify objects that are not alive. So, the philosopher uh, Wittgenstein said that the limits of my language means the limit of my world. And I think this happens to us uh, C++ developers. And it creates a phenomenon that I'd like to call object fetishism, which is that when everything, when all you can name is an object, everything starts looking like an object, right? And we start modeling the world like objects. Unnecessarily. But just, of course, because our language is limited in this sense. It's very powerful also to be able to talk about objects, but it's a limitation in this sense. So let's say. Let's give an example of how this object fetishism manifests itself. Let's say we're building a database of people where we have this abstract that with some attributes of a person, and we have a vector with all the people um, that are stored in the database. Now, this is very value semantic so far, more or less, right? So the vectors can be copied, and structs can be copied, and this looks intuitively value semantic. But let's say we get a new requirement, and because everything is social these days, we want to have friends expressed in our database. So something that most C++ developers will do is to say, well, very easy, 
Each person has a vector with pointers to their friends, right? Um, well, you all can see that there is a problem here, right? Because the vector of persons does not guarantee a stable identity for the elements that it contains. So these pointers are going to be invalidated. But, uh, you know, we're, we know the rules, no problem. We just allocate them on the heap so we can ensure they have a stable identity. Now, of course, we still have the problem of uh, managing the fact that when I remove a person from the vector, the object is going to be distracted. I want to clean up the other references. So I, I can use a sharp pointer and a weak pointer on the other head. And, and at some point, I'm like, why are we doing this, right? Like, I'm a millennial, which means that I have lots of, or I live in a permanent identity crisis, basically. Um, but of all the things that I could be, I'm sure there is one that I am not. I am not a pointer. Why do you represent myself as a pointer in your database, right? Give me an identity. Give me an identity explicitly, with semantics that you can define, with rules, lifetimes that you can define. Once you do that, then this problem disappears. I can go back and represent, uh, store the things in a normal flat vector, because I manage the identities themselves, and just store uh, another vector with the identity of my friends. And now that I've liberated myself by giving an explicit value of identity uh, from the object representation, I am free to use more advanced data structures, actually, right? So I can, instead of using a vector, I can use an unordered map and an ordered set here. Or I can use a multi-index to you know, make it easier to guarantee, the, uh, for example, the, the, um, the transitivity of friendships or whatever I want to do with the database, right? Now I can store my data in a way that is more efficient because the representation doesn't have to be tied to the object lifetime and to the identity of the thing from the real world that I want to represent here. So what this shows is that I think that it's actually a continuum in C++ specifically, where on the one hand, we have, on the one extreme, we have very reference semantic code, right? Code that really requires understanding the objects, the pointers, the references in there. And on the other extreme, we have tools that allow us to do more declarative, denotative thinking, value-based thinking, functional programming at the other extreme of the of this continuum, right? And we have lots of tools, right, that push out the code in one direction or the other. Now, the good news is that you can always start by a more reference semantic API and wrap it in something that becomes value semantic through the means of abstraction. I'm going to show you an example. Let's look at this function. The function push back on a vector. <clears throat> is this code value semantic? Well, we think like vectors are more or less value semantic, right? Because they have a copy constructor, assignment, blah, blah. At the same time, this function pushback itself is not completely value semantic, right? Because I have to be careful on which object I am operating, right? I'm mutating a vector, and I have to make sure I'm not invalidating pointers or iterators from that vector, etc. So there is some value semantic in it, in the sense that the object itself defines its contents in terms of values, but the operation is mutating objects. But I can wrap it in a function that takes a vector by value and returns a vector by value. And through this mechanism, there are two copies happening that isolate the update from the particular objects in which it operates. So I started with a mutable API for pushback, and I've wrapped it into something that is a little bit more value semantic. There are other examples. Let's say I have an implementation type that I store in the share pointer. And this implementation type gives me a mutable API. Now, you will think, as soon as you see this, this is, well, this is shared mutable state, right? This is very non-value semantic. And I would say, well, it depends. It depends on what the interface of this full thing is going to be, right? If this full thing only provides const methods to update this thing, and thus copy on write, then this thing is not gonna uh, it's not gonna expose the mutations anywhere. So even though they are gonna be sharing of the representation of the values, 
uh, the actual API is going to be very value semantic, right? So uh, I can say, you know, I can get a modified foo where I just clone the implementation, I then mutate it in place, and then return it. And you could argue that this is not very efficient. And it is true. There are situations, though, in which you are discarding the original foo. So you could do this more efficiently and avoid the clone. And you can do this by overloading the modified method such that if it operates on a moved from value, we know that moved from values are anonymous. And if the implementation, this share pointer, is unique, right? This instance of foo is the only one that has a reference to the actual implementation value. Well, then we can do this in place. Otherwise, of course, we have to do the, uh, the copy version, right? And with this, we kind of achieve the best of, all, of both worlds, right? If we need the efficiency of mutation, and we can do mutation because we are operating on things that are going away, we can do so with a move from value. Otherwise, uh, we do the copying. One disclaimer, the unique method of uh, the standard share pointers is not thread safe. Um, it can be done uh, thread safe, and there are other implementations of share pointers uh, that do this. So be very careful when doing this. Don't use the share pointer from the standard library to do this um, pattern. OK, other things. Let's say you have a class that represents a screen. A screen is very much a thing, right? It's something that I have uh, in my computer uh, with pixels on it, and actually I want to modify the pixels of it somehow, and I can definitely not copy the screen itself, right? Uh, just by copying a, a class, I need to manufacture a new one. Um, so, of course, we can still do things in this more valuey way by using the uh, trick I just shown, right? I can say, well, I cannot copy a screen, but I can draw on a screen and get a new screen with the contents drawn on it. The only uh, condition I'm going to put you is that you have to give away your old screen, right? <laughs> Arguably, this is just a syntactic change, actually, right? So uh, even though you can do this, I don't think we are gaining that much by doing this. Um, it's maybe an interesting conceptual realization. There are other better ways to achieve a higher level, more value way of doing things when drawing in screens, which is basically separating what you want to draw from the drawing itself. And one pattern to do this is by, for example, having the draw method not draw the pixels to the screen itself, but returning a function that requires a context, probably something from some subsystem that is hard to get. Right? It's like the IO monad in if you do Haskell, um, that actually draws the screen. These functions, they can be composed. So you can get this function and compose it with other ones using function composition and create an elaborate drawing with a drawing itself. Then this is returned somewhere in the system that will actually evaluate this set of functions in the appropriate con context and apply the side effects. You're decoupling the description of what you want to do with the side effects uh, themselves. OK, another technique to raise the level of abstraction. Um, uh, this comes from the web world. Uh, let's say you want to manipulate a document, in this case, the document that is represented in a website. So you want to represent this document as a value. And then eventually, you know, the user clicks a button, and you need to change the document. You want to add uh, some element that says sure, and an element to a list or something. So now you get another value, right? It would be very expensive to just replace the whole document directly, at least in some situations. Um, but one thing that you can do is that you can have an efficient different algorithm that compares the two documents and says, reconstruct basically what happened between them, which is that these two elements were added, and then actually does this minimum set of mutations in the actual object-oriented underlying model that there is behind these more value representations. And this technique uh, is what basically React.js does. Right? React.js is you represent 
your document as lightweight values, then the system compares them and does the mutation in place. This is a very powerful uh, tool. So we get to the question, when to use value semantics? And I used to think, and I don't think this anymore, uh, that values are useful in micro design when writing little functions. I mean, it's the first thing you learn when you do functional programming, how to do map and filter, uh, how to express a little, you know, a couple of loops as without using loops, all these things. And we have lots of tools also in the standard, uh, like vectors. Basically, most of the types, the little types of the standard, they are valuing. And as you get to the root of your system, as you raise the level of abstraction, you're talking about systems, components, big things, then you talk of objects and the relationships as, uh, or you relate them via, you know, messages that do mutations and, and their side effects. And I think we do that not because it's better, we do this because it's easy. Because the APIs that we have for doing big things, like doing a UI or talking to a web service, they are in this way. And because the tools we have for doing small things, they are in this way. But I think that it's more valuable to actually use objects and mutation in the micro design. Because in the small scope, these bad things that happen when you do use a lot of mutation, it's reduced, right? There is a small scope by definition. So you can reason about the mutations that are happening around, and you can do this. This is also very useful for writing efficient code. That's why we use C++. But when you get to the architecture of your system, then you have lots of things. Now you need to simplify. Now you need to use values. And of course, the tools we use, they don't go in this direction. This is hard. And doing simple things, it's hard. But because it's hard, it's actually because it's, it's the reason why it's valuable, right? So this basically answers, uh, this, this is the thesis that answers the question that is proposed with the title of this talk. What are the most valuable values? I would say the values that operate at the architectural level of our application that allow us to simplify the system in the big components. So the second part of this talk is gonna exercise these ideas by talking about a value-based architecture for getting interactive software. And interactive software is interesting. We've been doing this for many years already, 30, 40. Um, and there are some very established architectures and patterns that you use even though anybody that has written in big interactive software knows they are widely <laughs> insatisfying, right? Um, so the standard way of doing things is a model controller view and MCV or MVC architecture, um, where we have this model that is observed by the view. So the view knows about the model probably directly to update itself. The model knows about the view indirectly through callbacks, that's the uh, dotted lines, uh, such that the view can update itself when the model updates. And then there is this controller thing that kind of binds everything together and has sometimes arrows to more things, sometimes arrows to less things. Now, my critique of this architecture is that it's normally understood as objects, right? So the models, we're talking about model objects, controller objects, view objects. And the arrows here, they are pointers, right? Either direct ones, the dotted ones, or indirect through the objects that we capture in the closures that we put in the listeners. And it's very hard to compose objects. So we, we, you have like multiple views and multiple models and multiple controllers. You end up with these webs of models, controllers, and views. And to really understand the system, you cannot isolate one part, you have to understand all the things, because you update, you know, you do this thing in this view, which updates the model, which updates the other one, triggers these five callbacks, blah, 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 blah. And then there is this spaghetti code monster that is eating over your code, right? So and many, many people these days are asking themselves, is there an, a better way to do this? Um, so I would like to start, again, by abstracting things and trying to think what is the thing we're trying to do? Uh, when we're building interactive software, right? So we have this person that is interacting with our system, 
And this person has a mental model of the world. And of course, we want to build a complementary data model in the computer that is a representation of this or a subset of this data model that is useful for the computer to help this person achieve some goals. So this person is going to interact with the computer by performing actions, and it's going to expect that the computer does something useful, something that for them is going to be slow and costly, and it's going to, of course, represent the result back immediately in a form that they can consume, update their meta mental model of the world, and continue using the software. Right? So these things are related in these ways. right? So you have a mental model of the world, and this translates, or using your will, which is a transformation, you, turn, you transform your mental model of the world into actions, and you do things. And these things go into the computer, and it's used to update the data model. And the data model is related to the view in that it's rendered somehow to, uh, to produce this, uh, this new representation. And in the end, we also have a mechanism called perception that is going to update our data model and complete the cycle of our interactive software system. Now, we can cut this thing in two parts. And in the top part, we have uh, what normally UX design is preoccupied with, right? which is trying to understand what's the mental model that users have and what kind of actions, in which way do they want to interact with the software. In the bottom part, we have the stuff that we software engineers do, which is try to, in the end, accommodate this in ways that uh, the computer can process. So we can take the bottom part, and now we get this very beautiful picture. And it's beautiful uh, because it has boxes and arrows, but all the boxes and arrows go in the same direction. This is called the unidirectional data flow architecture. I didn't invent it myself. I think this name was coined maybe by someone at Facebook. Uh, it's very often named in the context of React and Redux and many of the web technologies. Um, what's beautiful here is not only that these boxes and arrows go in the same direction, it's that they are values. They are not objects. So this action is an action value that is related to the data model through an update function. And function here in the really functional sense, right? It takes a value of the current model, it takes the action that happened in the world as a value, and it returns a new value with the updated model. Right? It doesn't change the model in place, necessarily, at least in a conceptual uh, level. Again, the model is connected to the views through the uh, render function, which is also a function. It takes a model and it returns a new representation of it for human consumption as a value. If you don't have React, which is what allows us to implement this render function efficiently in a web browser, you may also use, uh, for example, an immediate mode API, which is going to use side effects to actually render the view. But if, I believe that in many ways it's actually conceptually similar to, uh, to this pure render function. Of course, somewhere in the system, you're going to have something that hooks a way in which this view uh, uh, can lead to the generation of new actions, right? So you have a dispatch function uh, that will happen asynchronously and that triggers this cascade of updates. I'm going to give you an example of how to uh, implement this architecture. Um, and it's going to be a deceptively simple example. Uh, wait. The advantage of that is that, um, well, you're not, uh, distracted by, by the complexities of the model itself. Uh, we're going to be preoccupied only by the, by the architectural aspects of it, I think. Uh, 
Um, okay, so this is just a counter application. Uh, so I have a counter here that is zero. I can increment it by typing the plus command, increment it by pressing the minus command, and reset it by using, I think, the dot command. Right? It's extremely damp. How do we do this uh, using this architecture? Well, um, what we will do is to, first, we have to design our model, right? And in this case, it's just an integer. Uh, we put it in a struct here. It doesn't even need to be in a struct, just to give it a, a more explicit name. Then we have the actions, right? We want to represent them as values, so I'm going to give them types. And an instance of each of these types is going to be the value uh, for that represents this action. So I have the increment action, the decrement action, and the reset action that tells also the value it wants to, to sit, reset it to, which defaults to zero. Now, these values, they have different types. Since I only had one update function in my architecture, I need to merge them such that I can get one single action type. Uh, I use this uh, STD variant, the new C++17 uh, union, type safe union type, uh, that allow me to have one action type independent of multiple actions. And the update function is almost trivial. I just have to visit the variant and say, depending on which action, I return a new model with the value incremented, decremented, etc. Now there is a draw function that in this case, uh, well, just prints to the standard output the current value. Then it's the intent function. I didn't show this in the architecture picture, um, but it's very often encountered because you want to translate the actual closer to the user representation of the action, like the key that came from the keyboard, to the more intentional action, right, uh, which is the increment, the decrement, etc. And finally, we just have a main loop where we have the state, we read the event, and for each event that happens, we apply the intent function to know what the user meant to do. If they meant to do something, we update the state, and we redraw it, right? What's interesting here, I find, is that there is only one real mutable variable that has to live through the whole lifetime of the application which is the state variable, right? If you have a more complicated system, normally you will have you know, lots of objects that talk to each other. In this case, even if you add more things to the model, you will only have this one uh, mutable variable. And we're doing your application logic or business logic, whatever you call it to prefer, you're gonna do it in the update function without uh, mutating objects uh, in a big scope. And this architecture, as I said, I didn't invent it myself, and there are many frameworks, actually, that help you implement it in concrete software. It's very exercised on the web world, so we have Elm, which is a language that is like a simplified Haskell designed to write interactive software using this architecture. We have Redux, which is a library um, uh, written by someone that now works uh, writing React as well, that is a data model library that you can use uh, to implement this architecture, and I wrote one uh, that is very small and simple in the end, uh, that is Redux for C++, it's called Lager. Here is the uh, GitHub page. Uh, I will put the link at the end again. So let's say I want to do another version that is, uses asynchronous I.O., of course, because that was like, I mean, it was using blocking I.O., it's like too dumb. So uh, let me show you how the other one looks like. This is using any courses, and it uses asynchronous I.O., you know, so I can press directly keys. There are more things that could be happening. Um, it's a little bit more elaborate. Oh, sorry. What did I do? No. No. Um, 
And we can do this uh, using this library. Uh, so we will have to update or to change our draw function, right? Because now we're using end courses to draw instead of standard output. We will have to change our intent function uh, such that instead of using the key simple character that I was using before, we use uh, slightly different things that come from end courses. Um, and then I need to instantiate uh, a main loop device. In this case, I'm using IO service, uh, but you could have something else if you're binding with something else. And then the main function of the library is this make store function, where I pass it as a template argument what kind of actions can happen in my system, and then I give it my initial state, my update function, my draw function, and then my main loop. And it binds all these things together and provides me uh, with an asynchronous save dispatch function um, that glues everything together, right? So finally, I also instantiate this terminal object. It's a little uh, IO service friendly wrapper around end courses I wrote. And uh, we say, well, when there is an event coming from the terminal, dispatch an event, dispatch an action in the store, right? Which triggers the cascade of this um, data flow architecture. And then we just let the application run. Now, one of the big advantages of this architecture is that uh, we can automatically extend our application and implement generic tooling that um, operate at data model level. So, for example, I wrote a debug uh, tool that allows you, it's a time traveling debugger, that allows you to go back to any previous state of your application. We can do this so just by um, simply instantiating, in this case, a debug server, because uh, this, is gonna, this debugger is gonna be exposed to the outside world through a, a RESTful API, and it's gonna give me like a web browser UI to use it. And I just have to say enable debug with this debug server when building the store, and this is enough to get the time traveling debugger in my application. I'm gonna show you how this works. Um, all right, so if I use, oh, actually this one is enough. So I navigate, you know, I use it a little bit, and then I open Firefox, I go, see. Not needed anymore. Okay, cool. So when I open this debugger, I can see uh, the last action that occurred, represented as JSON, uh, also the model. Of course, for this, there is one thing that I didn't show, which is that I annotated my structs with some uh, metaprogramming things such that they, it can be serialized to JSON automatically. Um, and I can automatically inspect everything that happened before, right, so I can see that the value was four, blah, 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 and I did a few increments and then some decrements, and maybe, you know, there was a bug here, and I want to see how the application looked like, so I can double click here, and I bring back the application to that state, and I can even interact with the application, so I can do this, and now, of course, it erased the rest of the history, and uh, it's like basically I did undo in, in the application, right? I get like a global undo in my application. Um, I have an experimental branch where I'm doing like a tree-based uh, undo history, so you never lose anything, even when you read out. I didn't have enough time to finish it for the talk. Too bad. Um, so how does this work? I'm gonna sketch a little bit how the implementation of this works. Um, this is the time traveling debugger part. So basically, um, this debugger thing is templatized over the action type that is happening in the application, right? So this enable debug would instantiate some of the things that I'm gonna define in this scope with this particular action and model. 
And basically, it's defined using the same tools I used to build the application itself. So I define some actions that the debugger is gonna use. So the go to action, that in this case takes a cursor, you know, the position in the history that I want to go to. And undo action and a redo action, which are basically aliases on go to minus one and plus one. And then I define a variant with the actions that my application take, which are the go to action, the undo action, and the redo action, and the action of the application itself, right? Because this debugger is grouping the application, and if it gets an action of the application, it actually is in charge of delivering it downwards. Um, we have the model, and the model, it's again a grouper of the model of the application, where we have an instance of the initial model, we have the cursor, the current position in the history, and then we have the history which is all the actions kept in a vector. I don't use an STD vector, I use an Emer vector, vector. It's a vector of these immutable data structures uh, library I made, which makes efficient having updated the vector without getting a full copy of the data under it. Otherwise, of course, you know, this uh, could potentially lead to, to performance problems. I can create a model which initializes the initial value and I can, of course, ungrab the model, get the model of the underlying application, but querying what is the current state, which is associated to the current course of position. Then we have the update function, and the update function is like the update function we had before, but it also has as a parameter the update function of the underlying application, right? Because if it has to go to undo or redo, it will do something, which is very simple, you can imagine, it's just updating the cursor. But if it gets an action of the application, well, it just has to call the reducer, basically the update function of the application itself, it will get a new state, and then probably it will put that new state in this vector of histories, etc. cetera. Right, so that's the, the reducer. Reducer is another name coming from Redux for the update function, and we call it here. Now, there is something very cool, right? Because we saw we can de decorate any application uh, with this. Well, we can decorate the debugger itself with this and debug the debugger using the debugger. So I can instantiate a second debug server uh, I can compose the two enable debug functions. They are actually simple functions. Uh, and then I just get a debugger to debug the debugger. Let me show you how that actually works. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. It's a little bit hard to see from here. Um, let me open a new window. And Copy this one. And this doesn't work because I should have executed this one, which is the one that has the mechanism. Okay, so I'll do a few things here, right? I have some history here. And then here, okay, I have actually a history with the same number of steps, right? Because I did a few things in the application that did the same number of things in the debugger. Now, in the debugger, I can say undo a couple of times. Now, what's interesting here is that, of course, in the meta debugger, I get new states, right? Because in the debugger itself, the undo was an action that generated a new state. And I can see here that the whole history that is kept by the other debugger, right? Uh, so this is very interesting. Uh, way to, to see you know, the power of these compositional elements of these architectures that we're promoting. As I said, and I guess you hinted, we can do this one extra time, right? And now we get this cube of histories. What is gonna happen here, if I go ahead and run the meta, meta debugger, right? I should be able to go back in time and then 
go back in the debugger of the debugger, which goes forward in time, and then go back in the debugger of the debugger of the debugger, which goes again backwards in time, in another dimension or something. I don't know, let's try. What's happening here? <laughs> no, this is not what I meant. I'm sorry. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I am Hans Peter Bolivarno, representative of the Berlin delegation in the Intergalactic Federation of the year 2048. This is a message of love and peace, sent through a time traveling meta meta debugger to C developers of the year 2018. The future looks grim from the year 2018. Neofascism is rising all over the Western world. Twitter is driving us into collective madness. Ah. And worst of all, JavaScript is the most used programming language in the world. What? But never underestimate the power of human ingenuity and collaboration. By the middle of the century, we have built prosperous, peaceful, and equal societies. We even solved climate change. Sorry, people of Seattle, you are not getting Californian weather anytime soon. But most important for us developers, object fetishist programming and spaghetti code monsters are now a thing of the past. Developers all around the world have adopted declarative architectures and value semantics. The last race condition was ever seen in the year 2032, and it is kept in the Museum of Horrors of Programming in Orion, for new generations learn not to repeat our history. Thanks to this, programmers of the future enjoy unprecedented peace of mind. As surprising as it may sound, C++ developers now have so much time, they now even know how to dance. Look at this live footage from CBBCon 2048. <laughs> so remember folks, avoid your mutable state. Bye, Tobarishi! sure this doesn't ever happen again. <laughs> um, okay, well, sorry for that interruption. Uh, I guess this is anyways a good point to bring some closure to the talk. Uh, so let's uh, try to uh, talk about some last further topics that you can research if you are interested uh, and you like the ideas proposed in this talk. So one thing that I didn't talk about uh, in this talk is uh, how to do when you need to do side effects that are derived from the logic that happens in the update function, right? So your update function analyzes the action, and then you realize, well, I need to load a file, or I need to save a file, or make a network request. There are different ways to uh, include this in this Redux architecture. And one of them is by having effects be a functions uh, a function that is evaluated in some context that is hard to get. Um, and the update function can, in this case, return the new model that is a value thingy, and it can return the effect without calling it itself uh, that is then later going to be applied in the real world. Right? This is, for example, what Elm does with something they call commands, um, and there are several extensions to Redux that also do it. It's also supported by the Lager library. Another thing you might be thinking about is, well, these examples were very small, the amount of data was very small. Uh, what happens if you have very big documents with lots of data? Uh, how do you make that efficiently? And I gave a talk last year at CPPCon where I talked precisely about that, so if you're skeptical about whether this can work for big documents, uh, see the immutable data structures talk, um, and that also shows a text editor that is now using this Lager library directly and you can debug with this time traveling debugger. So it also has a little bit more complicated logic, and you can uh, see a little bit uh, how this scales as you add more elements to the system. 
Um, also, this architecture that I propose here, uh, of course, has quite uh, interesting applications in the context of interactive software or some subsets of it. Uh, but I didn't talk so much about the scenario. I don't know if you remember uh, the different ways we had to model things in a computer, where the first one was having a value of the whole uh, existence of the thing. Um, that's very useful, too, and there are uh, very good tools also for doing that in C++. I recommend this talk by Kirk Schub, uh, Kirk Schub about uh, Rx C++, which is a library he wrote. It's called no row std thread, which basically gives you these composable streams of elements that I believe is a way of modeling the world through values that represent the existence of things, even things with an unknown future, uh, streams of events. And yeah, just finally as a conclusion, uh, I think of all the things you've seen, uh, the takeaway is this. Uh, even though it's hard, even though it's not always perfectly possible, try to use value semantics, value thinking, declarative thinking, when you move up in your architecture, when you move to the big components of, of your system, and leave the objects for the low-level details and try to think about how to connect these two in a way, of course, that is not leaking uh, and, and moving safely from reference semantic to value semantics. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, these are the links to the, uh, all the projects that I just presented, also my personal website. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. And I think we have four minutes for questions, if there are any. Uh, there is a microphone here, if you wanna come here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Do you have any benchmarks? Benchmarks? Yeah. Of what? How, I don't know, just something to indicate that there's not a lot of overhead associated with this uh, approach. Uh, well, uh, I mean, the architecture itself, it's hard to benchmark, right? Like, you will have to write two applications with the same purpose and compare them. Um, as I said, there are tools in particular like the data structures that I believe make this architecture performant. And that has lots of benchmarks. In fact, I wrote a paper for the International Conference uh, Functional Programming, uh, which has like more rigorous academic uh, benchmarking in it. Um, there is also the text editor um, I mentioned, uh, which can edit files up to several gigabytes uh, with very fluid uh, operations and interactions. Um, so yeah, I believe these techniques can be made perform for sure. In, very often it's actually more performant than the equivalent uh, messes of object things and million callbacks that update things and you end up updating everything twice uh, because you don't know what's invalidated anymore. Um, of course, it depends on the particular systems the requirements and everything. Cool, thank you, it's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. If you're too shout, you can also shout the question and I will repeat it. Well, anyways, uh, I will be available uh, around if you want to maybe like discuss this further uh, in person. Uh, thank you again for listening, see you around. <laughs>